Genesis chapter 9, and our topic is Noah and the Ark, although our topic today is going to be the death penalty for murder, and we're going to look at that this morning and this afternoon, and <clears throat> a very, very important topic, and then we're going to wrap up our consideration of Noah and the flood, and um, it'll be very, very interesting. I'm going to read verses 1 through 17. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hands are they delivered. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you, even as the green herb have I given you all things. <coughs> but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, Shall ye not eat? And then this is the beginning of our text, verse 5. And surely your blood of your lives will I require at the hand of every beast will I require it, and at the hand of man. At the hand of every man's brother will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed. For in, for in the image of God made he man. And you be ye fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And be, I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. And every living creature that is with you, of the fowl, of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth, and I'll establish my covenant with you. Neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there be any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant. A better translation would be a sign of the covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do not set my bow in the cloud. Excuse me, I do set my bow in the cloud and it, or rainbow, the Hebrew word means both. I do set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I'll remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. And if you look at a bow, what is a bow shaped like? Well, a bow is shaped just like a rainbow. And the Hebrew word is, can mean both. So after the flood, we've already considered up to verse 4, after the flood, God not only informs Noah of a new aspect of dominion over the creatures, remember he re-establishes the dominion covenant given to Adam, Noah is the second Adam, but he reveals a new power over man himself, <clears throat> and that is the power of the sword, or the institution of the death penalty for murder. And I'm just going to read 5 through 7 again. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whosoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And ask you to be fruitful and multiply and so on. Before the flood, we read earlier that the world was full of violence and murder. It was a bloody type of world. It was a South Central LA kind of world. <clears throat> Jehovah thus makes provision to restrain that violence by the establishment <clears throat> of an absolutely inviolable law regarding unlawful bloodshed. So the context here is significant. He had just destroyed all life and violence was emphasized. Bloodshed was emphasized. And now he's going to Restrain that wickedness. <clears throat> Murder was always unlawful. 
and always merited death. But due to the fall, man needs a special revelation from God to make this point clear. God not only sets forth the requirement of the death penalty, but gives a reason as well. This direct revelation from Jehovah, which is given in the context of a blessing to Noah and his family, proves that judicial laws and appropriate punishments cannot be determined from natural law. God does not leave the determining of the proper penalty for murder for man to discover for himself in nature. Now one could say, yeah, it's not hard to figure out and throughout most of history, uh, men have put people to death for murder. But it's been applied extremely inconsistently. And of course today it's not applied at all in, Europe, in all of Europe uh, and in most of America. America's pretty much done away with it. So he tells man precisely what to do. So remember, biblical law comes from God. The laws of the heathen nations were often unjust and were always state-centered. And people talk about how wonderful the Code of Hammurabi was. The Code of Hammurabi contained many injustices. And the Code of Hammurabi, if you committed murder, let's say you killed your next door neighbor's son, you didn't die, your son was put to death, who did nothing. That's not justice. The laws that Jehovah reveals to us are always just and they are always God-centered. Now, God's law is different from humanistic law and that it has reasons and motivations built into it, as we're gonna see here. Humanistic law is arbitrary, it is changing, and it is local. Go all over the world and you'll find different laws. While God's law is absolute, unchanging, and universal. And this is a universal law. Now, the command applies to animals. From the hand of every beast I'll require it, and remember, animals do not have a rational, a sense of reason or a sense of right and wrong, like human beings. They're not created in God's image. And the law of Moses elaborates on this principle in Exodus 21, 28 to 29. Here's what it says. <clears throat> if an ox gores a man or a woman to death, then the ox shall surely be stoned, for its flesh shall not be eaten, and its flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be acquitted. But if the ox tended to thrust with its horns in times past, and it has been made known to its owner, his owner, and he has not kept it confined so that it has killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and its owner also shall be put to death. So even a dumb ox, or we might say a bull, anybody who knows anything about bulls, bulls can be very aggressive. Cows are very mild and meek. I've never seen anyone attacked by a cow. Uh, but you get around a bull and you're likely to get attacked. The fact that wild beasts are held accountable by God for taking human life, even though animals are not rational, even though that may be since the fall, post -fall the post-fall creation, even that may be the ra uh, animal's normal uh, nature, you know, tigers, for example. Tigers are naturally man-killers or a lion. Many animals after the fall are wild carnivores who kill as a result of their post-fall natural urges. <clears throat> the execution of the guilty animal is non-negotiable. It has to take place. This fact indicates that when it comes to first or second degree murder, circumstances such as age, mental state, you know, the so-called insanity plea, are not to be considered when determining the penalty. The guilty animal or human must die. Okay, so if a guy goes out and he smokes a bunch of crack and takes LSD and 
stab somebody because he's totally out of his mind, he needs to be executed. Period. There should, be, there should be no such thing as an insanity defense in biblical law. There is none. There is none. And there's no such thing as if you're a 13-year-old and you go out and you shoot somebody with a gun, you don't go, oh, well, he was only 13. He gets out when he's 21. No. He's tried just like an adult. He's put to death just like an adult. That's biblical law. That's justice. Human beings are given the freedom to kill animals in order to use meat, their, uh, their meat for food, as long as the blood is drained. <coughs> animals are lesser creatures who do not, who are not rational, are not given the same freedom with regard to human beings. Okay, we can kill animals and eat them for food. Animals aren't allowed to kill us. The word of God places a sharp demarcation between man who is made in his image and the animal world which is not. So the Bible emphatically repudiates New Age mysticism or Hindu thought which teaches that all creatures are part of God and all are intrinsically sacred. No, you, you smile and you, you giggle at that but it's true. You go to India and they won't harm they won't harm a rat. They won't harm a cow. They could be starving to death and the cow's fat and, and they won't touch it. The strict vegetarianism of Eastern thought is based on a pagan worldview. Now certainly if you, for health reasons, or you, you simply don't like to eat meat and you want to be a vegetarian, fine, but don't give me some philosophy that it's superior ethically. It's not. God flat out says we're allowed to eat meat. It also repudiates secular humanism or Darwinian, Darwinian philosophy, which, <coughs> excuse me, which simply places man on a higher scale of being than the animals. We're the pinnacle of evolution. We're not a separate class of creatures with a, with a, a distinct soul, with a distinct uh, image of God. We're simply greater on a scale of being than the amoeba or the pond slime from which we supposedly evolved. Such thinking places men in the animal realm, okay, we're just simply naked apes, and makes all the animals man's relatives. And so vegetarians have a legitimate argument there if you accept that pagan worldview. Why in the world would you eat a cow who's your distant relative? Well, it's pagan nonsense. It inevitably leads either to the exaltation of the animals and views akin to Eastern mysticism. You see this among uh, the radical vegans, the radical vegetarians in the United States who are a bunch of socialist left-wingers. And they've taken this evolutionary worldview to its logical extent toward a view that's almost identical with Eastern mysticism an animal, a, a man is no different than a pig or a cow or a chicken. And they actually write articles, the chicken holocaust. I'm serious. Rushton, he used to, I used to get these tapes of him and Otto Scott sitting around talking and he would read articles out of their magazines and they'd both chuckle as, you know, uh, about the beautiful little piggy, our relative and so forth. It inevitably leads either to the exaltation of the animals, Eastern mysticism, or to the degradation of man as simply a sophisticated beast that can be manipulated, abused, and even killed by the state if necessary. The old thing, if everything is God, the dog excrement is God, the rock is God, and you're God. Well, nothing has any value. It's all the same. We must remember that virtually all of the mass executions of the 20th century were, uh, were done by fanatical, dedicated communists. Lenin, or, or Nazis, Lenin, who, uh, and Hitler was a socialist, Lenin, Hitler, Stalin, Mao, Pol Pot, Ho Chi Minh, etc. 
Millions and millions of people were murdered in cold blood. And the argument is, so what? It's no different than eating a hamburger. They're not, human beings aren't sacred. It's a materialistic world, and if it helps the state, so be it. One of the illusions of the 20th century held by many has been the idea that humane actions could exist without Christianity. <clears throat> With the Ten Commandments barred from the state schools, the schools have been producing a generation of lawless youth and murders have been commonplace. I remember when I, I went to public schools and then I, when I was in high school, I went to a Roman Catholic high school, supposed to be better. And I, I used to debate with my teachers when I was an atheist. I used to be an atheist and I would debate with my teachers. What's wrong with murder? Why not? We evolved from pond scum. And when you die, you cease to exist. It's as though you never, ever existed. Your life is meaningless. And then, of course, someday the world's going to blow up in a supernova and it'll be as though humanity never even existed. So who cares what I do? Who cares if I smoke pot and lie and cheat on my test? Who cares if a man commits adultery? Who cares if Stalin murdered 20 million Ukrainians? Who cares? They have no basis for meaning or ethics whatsoever. The requirement of the death penalty for murder is based on the biblical assumption, the biblical teaching, <clears throat> that all physical life comes from a direct creation by God. Okay, the more and more you study, we study doctrine, the more and more we study theology as we look at scripture, the more and more we see that every single doctrine in the Bible is intimately interrelated. And that's why it's crucial that Christians hold the line against so-called theistic evolution which is heretical nonsense. If you have an unbiblical doctrine of creation, it's going to affect how you view man. It's going to affect how you view Jesus Christ. It's going to affect other doctrines. It's crucial. The Bible teaches all creation, all life comes from God. Consequently, all life receives its meaning and purpose from him. <clears throat> the creation is his work and it belongs to him, not man. Not the animals, not the state. The state doesn't define life. The Supreme Court doesn't define life. God does. And what the rule of law really means is, is the Supreme Court and the legislature in our states and in our nation ought to be going to Scripture and saying, oh, this is life. This is what life is defined as. Uh, go round up the abortion doctors and the abortion nurses and the people that work in their office, and they should all be executed for murder. It's not going to happen until there's a revival or a reformation. The life of man is precious in God's sight because man was made in his image. The secular humanistic idea that man's life is intrinsically sacred as the pinnacle of evolution is irrational and it's idolatrous. Now, given these biblical realities, man has no right to kill another human being without proper biblical justification from God. Anyone who kills another man unlawfully will be accountable to God for his actions. Life is created by God and can be assailed or taken only on God's terms. The terms of life are established by God. God is the giver of all, <coughs> establishes the laws of all of life and for all things all else. Hence, Every aspect of this law that we read, given to Noah, restated in the Mosaic law, <coughs> is a religious duty. Is a religious duty, and as Rush Duny points out brilliantly, all law is inescapably religious because it has to be founded, in some sense, on a world and life view. Thou shalt not murder. Why? Well, if you don't believe in God, you've got to come up with a reason. And the reason will be, well, man's a pinnacle of evolution. Or you have to come up with a utilitarian reason. And all those things can be proved as irrational and stupid. 
If you don't believe in God, you have no reason why not to murder. Both the giving and taking of life are aspect of man's religious duty. This means that a man must not only avoid committing murder and seek the apprehension of a murderer, it's a religious duty, but he must also seek the death penalty. It is a religious duty. The Christian who argues, and I used to hear this from neo-evangelicals back in the 80s. This was really popular. It was a stupid thing. We're consistently pro-life. We're against abortion and we're against the death penalty. What an unbiblical, idiotic statement. If you're for life, you have to be for the death penalty, as we'll see in a moment. The modern Western nations have rejected the word of God and have adopted macroevolutionary theory as a fact. Okay, if you go to a public school, even if you go to a Roman Catholic school, they don't teach evolution as a theory. It's a theory with, without fact. It's a theory based on a religious presupposition. They teach it as fact. They say, oh, it's been proven. It's been totally established and proven. Which it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a theory in crisis, actually. Therefore, they have essentially adopted atheism as their world and life view and regard the penalty for murder as purely arbitrary, as something that men can decide for themselves. Consequently, since the Second World War, virtually all Western nations have abolished the death penalty and replaced it with prison sentences with parole, or life in prison. There was a man in Canada who murdered, they know of at least 29 women he murdered. It's probably much higher. And he, I forget what he got, it was either 25 years with the possibility of parole or 40 years of the possibility of parole. He killed 29 people. And they were, they were tortured too. And he doesn't even get the death penalty. There's a man in the Ukraine who murdered, they know of at least 52 people that he murdered. And uh, he did get the death penalty. But then when the Ukraine wanted to have connections and help from the European Union, they had to change that to a lengthy sentence with parole. Otherwise, the European Union wouldn't have any relationship with that. Because in the European Union, the death penalty is banned. Okay, this is the crazy world we live in. Many states within America still have the death penalty on their books, but the penalty is rarely applied. How many people are arrested for murder each year? Thousands. There are thousands of murders in the United States every year. Just this year, since the beginning of the year, there's already been 500 just in Chicago. Now, that doesn't mean there's been 500 arrests, but there's lots of murders. Very few people are executed. And most people would be shocked if they knew the number of murderers who were paroled. There was a man who committed a murder in, uh, it was either Oklahoma or Texas, and he was paroled after only 12 years. He took a pillow and he smothered a girl to death after he raped her, and he, got, he was paroled after 12 years. And then he got out and he killed five more women. That's common. These policies reflect the rejection of God's word and the absurdity and wickedness of unbelief. They are an explicit mockery of Jehovah and his law word and will certainly result not only in many more murders in our society, but also the outpouring of God's wrath on a rebellious culture. Okay, what happens today if you're, let's say, uh, you go shoot up a high school or you go shoot up a bunch of kids in, what was that, Connecticut? Or you go shoot up a movie theater, you become famous. And they think of themselves as celebrities and then they go to prison, uh, like Charles Manson, and they get love letters, and they get fan mail, and they're famous. No, they should be taken out, and they should be stoned to death, and have their skull crushed by stones. Our land is defiled for the blood of, these murder, of those murdered, cries out from the ground for justice. But there is no justice. If a guy murders 10 people, and he's watching color television in prison, and answering his fan mail... That is not justice. For this unrequited blood, God will exact vengeance upon our whole culture.
See, one thing you have to learn, there's a connection between God's law, obedience to God's law, and blessing and disobedience and cursing. And any nation who rejects God's law eventually will receive some kind of severe judgment. So if you care about the economy and, and, and the, the cost of living and all these kinds of things and inflation and all these kinds of things, you better be for God's law. The passage notes that capital punishment applies not only to guilty animals, but also men who murder other men. Now, God in the flood directly executed judgment and death upon mankind because of their widespread violence and murder. It was a kind of death penalty, wasn't it? Now he, he proceeds to set forth a law designed to restrain that violence and thus temper his judgments in history. <coughs> okay, that's what human government is for. That's what the civil magistrate is for. He wields the sword to restrain those who refuse to be restrained by self-law. The civil magistrate is not for people that are Christians who don't steal and lie and do all these kind of things. They're for the ungodly, the wicked, for manslayers, for murderers of mothers and fathers and so forth, as it says in 1 Timothy. Before the fall, there was no need of civil government. And the rule in the earth was to be in families. There's no evidence of any civil government being set up. This pattern continued after the fall, but this family authority was ineffective in restraining violence in the earth. Not only did family government not express the coercion and external threat necessary to restrain the wicked, but after the fall, most families have not been objective when it comes to the misbehavior and crimes of their own children. You know, that's sad but true. The law says that if your son or daughter commits something worthy of death, you should be willing to testify against them and cast the first stone if necessary. But tragically in history, that hasn't been the case. And you can see that today when you see people that are obviously guilty of heinous crimes, uh, their parents defending them tooth and nail to the, to the bitter end. For example, the man uh, in Indiana who was a security personnel for a, a big charismatic ministry who murdered his wife and children in cold blood, the evidence for that was overwhelming. And fortunately, he was convicted and given the death penalty, but he probably will never be executed. <clears throat> the flood was in part a result of this lack of effectiveness. Consequently, after the flood, God makes explicit provision for a sterner rule with more effective punishments to restrain external violence. That's what's happening here. From the analogy of Scripture, we know that the power of the sword was given into the hand of the civil magistrate. The command to know is the great charter of all civil magistrates, and of course it'll be expanded upon and restated in the law of God to Moses, which is not for Israel only. Okay? Laws against murder are not ceremonial. Now the statement at the hand of every man's brother probably emphasizes the wickedness of homicide in that since all men are created by God and descend from Adam and uh, Noah, all men uh, are made of one blood, Acts 17.26, have one father or creator, Malachi 2.10. For this reason, we find scripture referring to men who are not related, who are even strangers as brothers. Genesis 29.4, Leviticus 19.17, 25.14, 26.37, etc. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love thy brother. And Jesus explains, and in the context of the passage, the word brothers use, Jesus explains that does not refer simply to Jews. It refers to people you don't even know. Not the animal, but man is the brother, the relative of man. Humanity from the perspective of creation and recreation, the recreation narrative, is a family, a brotherhood. Now, I don't mean that in the liberal sense. We're all brothers and we're all going to heaven and God's our heavenly father and that kind of stuff. But there's a sense since we all descend from Adam, we all descend from Noah, that we are to treat each other as a brother in that sense, which means treat each other lawfully, treat each other uh, with kindness, with mercy, compassion, according to the law of God. Interestingly, 
This is the first time the word brother has been used since the Cain and Abel narrative in Genesis chapter 4, 8 to 11. It is likely that the word brother is used to call to mind the treachery of Cain's action in spilling blood and thus highlight Jehovah's hatred of murder. Now the concise poetic formulation, and it is very poetic in Hebrew, whoever sheds the blood of man, by a man shall his blood be shed, reveals the lex talionis, the law of retaliation, just retaliation, from Exodus 21, 23 to 25. <clears throat> but if any harm follows, then you shall give life for lie, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. In other words, the penalty must be commensurate with the crime. A life taken demands the taking of another life. Sitting in a cell block, watching color television and playing cards with your friends is not commensurate with the crime. Because murder removes a person from the realm of the living permanently, there can be no monetary substitution or remission of the penalty under any circumstances, period. Okay, if you have a pit bull and it gets out of the fence and it kills a kid and it's never happened before and you, the dog has always acted very nicely before that time, yeah, a penalty <clears throat> is, is made of, of restitution is made, a monetary recompense. But murder is a whole other matter. A monetary payment does not render justice or benefit someone who is dead. Consequently, in the law of Moses, the sentence of death is the only permissible penalty allowed. And so any state, any, any, any national government that gets rid of the death penalty or does not apply the death penalty is wicked. Is wicked. In rebellion against God. In Exodus 20, uh, 21 verse 12 we read, <clears throat> He who strikes a man so that he dies shall surely be put to death. And we heard that, we heard that language in the scripture reading about uh, Saul. In Hebrew that's a, a, an emphatic statement. It, it, you're making the statement as strong as possible. The verse deals with intentional homicide, or what we would call first or second degree murder. If someone is killed in an unintentional or accidental manner, you're out with your friend and you're chopping wood for the winter and you have a defective ax handle and the ax head flies off and strikes your buddy in the head and he dies, that's manslaughter. He gets to go to the city of refuge and he is not to be harmed. It was an accident. So the Bible makes a very clear distinction between intentional and unintentional homicide <clears throat> or manslaughter. The per person who committed the uh, accident flees to the city of refuge and remains alive. And um, see Numbers 35, 11 to 15. But if violence is purposeful, purposely used against another and he or she dies, no exemption to death can be made, period. No exemptions. No exemptions. When status, class, gender, age, or mental state makes no difference whatsoever, the murderer must die. Did you hear that? Status, class, gender, age, or mental state makes no difference whatsoever. Okay, if you look at the ancient world, if you were a, a Roman and you killed a slave deliberately, uh, they'd cut you slack. But if you killed another Roman citizen, you'd be in trouble. There's all sorts of exceptions made through history. Even our society. You know, when prostitutes, prostitutes are frequent victims of serial killers. They're easy prey. And of course, a lot of people don't know they're missing for quite a while. Uh, that should be treated just as serious a crime as somebody killing a uh, governor of, the sta of a state because they're made the image of God. The Hebrew shall surely be put to death is emphatic. 
Similarly, in Numbers, the law says, moreover, this is Numbers 35, 31, you shall take no ransom, that is a monetary payment, for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall surely, there's that emphatic language again, he shall surely be put to death. No exceptions. If payment was accepted for homicide, then the rich would be able to get away with murder. Here, here's a million bucks. Shut up and go away. No payment is accepted. Now, there are other crimes in the Bible where uh, the victim has a right to determine whether he'll accept a payment or exact a punishment. There's evidence of that for adultery. There's some evidence for that and certainly for things of bodily injury. You don't have to chop the guy's hand off, you can get, which is not gonna uh, do you a lot of good, unless you're just a vengeful person, but you can get proper restitution, which would be a huge sum of money. This penalty is the only way, by the way, that the shed blood would not continue to cry out for justice, Deuteronomy 19.13. And in Leviticus, the death penalty is stated again, 24.17, whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. And in many ancient cultures, we emphasize once again, if you killed a foreigner or a slave, you were not put to death. And in Roman society, you had the right to, put, to kill your wife or your children. They were considered your property. And if, a ch if one of your children got out of line and you went out there and you slit his throat, you would not even be arrested. The father had power of life and death over his family in Roman society. Now, given the clear and abundant testimony of Scripture on the death penalty, it is disturbing when Roman Catholic and Protestant leaders argue for mercy and leniency for murderers on death row because of some supposed special circumstance. And... Uh, there was a woman in Texas who was executed, I don't know, it's about six years ago now, maybe longer. And she had committed a horrible crime where her and her boyfriend went in and they hacked some people to death with an ax, deliberately. They robbed them and, and killed them with an ax and she swung the ax herself. Well, she got the death, death penalty and she deserved the death penalty and the time for her execution came. But in prison, she had said she was sorry and she'd become a professing Christian. So Pat Robertson and all these really prominent evangelicals, Chuck Colson and uh, all these prominent evangelicals, you know, started going on CNN and all these talk shows. You know, we got to get her out. She's, she, she, her, it should be commuted to life in prison. She's a Christian now. She's repented. It doesn't matter. She has to die. And George Bush, I think he was governor at the time. Thank, yeah, so it was quite a while ago. George Bush, thankfully, let her be put to death. He did not remit her penalty, and, and that was right. That was the just thing to do. We should not be surprised that Romanists and Protestant liberals are against the death penalty because they despise God's word. They hate God's word. Don't be surprised. <clears throat> Romanists have rejected it for their human traditions, and modernists have repudiated it for secular humanism and higher criticism. So don't be surprised if they're up against the death penalty. Of course, they're all for abortion. They don't want you to kill the guilty, they want you to kill the innocent. It shows that unbelief is madness. It is surprising, however, when evangelicals who claim to believe in the inspiration and authority of scripture treat these inspired commands as optional. And this is event modern evangelicalism. The Bible is treated as a smorgasbord I like this law. No, I don't like that law. I like this law. I don't like that law. And that's how modern evangelicalism is. Rush Duny has noted that the contempt for the death penalty as set forth in God's word is also a contempt for the cross of Christ, which sets forth the necessity of the death penalty in the sight of God. Quote, the basic principle of the death penalty was undergirded and set forth by Christ's atoning death, which made clear that the penalty for man's treason to God and departure from God's law is death without remission. The blood of the altar and the fact of the altar are thus a declaration of the necessity of capital punishment. 
to oppose capital punishment as prescribed by God's law is thus to oppose the cross of Christ and to deny the validity of the altar. End of quote. So you probably never thought of it that way, but that makes perfect sense. Now the reason given by God is that man is created in God's image. Man's life has value because it is a reflection in finite form of Jehovah. Man's life has value because we're made in the image of God. Man's life does not have value because some secular human in Supreme Court says so. Man's life does not have value because we're the, high, the pinnacle of evolution. Man's life has value because God says so, because God attributes value to it. The person who takes man's life takes something exceptionally valuable. He that murders another man destroys God's image and thus insults God who made man. The crime is so great that such a criminal forfeits his own right to live. There can be no adequate restitution for the deliberate taking of another life other than capital punishment. We must always remember that God is the fountain and author of life. No creature can give life to another. Creation, once again. God made life. We did not evolve from bacterial scum in primordial oceans. You just think of the absurdity of that. I just watched a television program of four billion, four, was it billion? Four billion years of evolution in Australia. And the show is a complete dishonest lie. They never tell you that without the oxygen, without the atmosphere, the earth is bombarded with deadly radiation that'll kill all life. It'd be like, not only does life have to evolve in the supposed primordial situation, life would have to evolve being bombarded with deadly radiation constantly. It'd be like trying to evolve life in your microwave with it turned on high. The absurdity of such thought. But God is the fountain and author of life. An archangel can't give life to an angel. An angel cannot give life to a man. Man cannot give life even to the meanest of the brute creation. They can't even create a virus or a bacteria in a lab. They've been trying for 100 years. They can't do it. And they'll never do it because it's impossible. It can't happen. Only God creates life. As God alone gives life, so he alone has the right to take it away. And he who without the authority of God takes away life is properly defined as a murderer. Any state that applies a death penalty area to areas outside of crimes that God has specified or that removes a death penalty to areas that God has applied it is essentially proclaiming its own divinity. Okay, when you see President Obama up there and Hillary Clinton and those people, they talk about, oh yeah, it's Easter, I'm going to go to church and worship Jesus. Those people are a bunch of rank idolaters who worship themselves as God and proclaim themselves as God. On this matter is clear. <clears throat> Capital punishment is by the express commandment of God. And thus when lawgivers push it aside for life imprisonment, or even worse, prison with parole, they deny biblical justice and mock God and man who is made in God's image. No man should be a pastor or an elder who does not believe in the death penalty strongly. Such a person does not believe in the authority of Scripture and is unqualified, and I would question whether even a, they're even a Christian. Our culture's refusal to execute murderers, murderers, even in cases when the evidence against the criminal is overwhelming, is evidence of a society that has rejected God in the Bible for human autonomy and ethics and civil justice. When you've got a guy, and they've got his fingerprints, they've got the DNA, he confesses that he murdered the people, he takes them to the graves and shows them where the graves are, and then they turn around and say he can have parole after 25 or 40 years, and he's not going to be executed. That's madness. 
in our own system. The rights of the victims are largely ignored in favor of the so-called rights of the murderer. It's true. And this is all done in the name of humanity and is regarded as compassionate. Who are the biggest, biggest supporters against the death penalty? Liberals. Liberals. They're the most satanic and the most evil. But in reality, it is cruel to society and especially to victims' families who do not receive proper justice and proper closure. Anybody, if you've watched any of these crime shows, just regular people, it's just the way people are by nature. When a loved one is murdered, whether it's a wife or a husband or a son or a daughter or even a brother or a sister or a grandparent, they cry out for justice. And if they don't get justice, they don't get closure. Now, it's always going to hurt them the rest of their life, but justice brings closure like nothing else can. The argument that is often used for this practice is that life in prison is worse than death. You've heard that? Oh, I'd rather have him get life in prison. That's worse than being executed. Well, what does that presuppose? That presupposes atheism. That presupposes that death ends it all. That God is not waiting to take that murderer and to cast him into the lowest parts of hell to suffer for his pain, what he's done. The Christian worldview teaches us that murder is so reprehensible that the murderer is to be killed immediately after a fair trial and turned directly over to God for punishment. And I've watched a number of crime shows. I don't like network television. It's garbage. I like, I like history and these kind of things. I, I do watch crime shows. And I can tell you, people don't fear life in prison. They fear the death penalty. Even though they may not believe in Christ, even though they may not believe in God, there's this inner sense of death brings judgment. Kill them. Turn them right over to God. Then they'll get their justice. Then you won't have Charles Manchin in prison grinning and laughing for the cameras. He won't be grinning and laughing anymore. Hell is far worse than life in prison. Matthew Henry says this. Man is a creature dear to his creator. And therefore ought to be so to us. God put honor upon him. Let us not put contempt upon him. And when a murder, end of quote, and when a murderer is not executed, you're putting contempt upon the victim. You're putting contempt upon the victim's families. You're putting contempt upon the whole culture, which allows such a thing. <clears throat> we need a biblical view of man in order to restrain violence in society. <clears throat> if you don't believe in creationism, if you don't believe in Christ, if you don't believe in the God of the Bible, you're going to have all sorts of problems. <clears throat> we are to love our neighbor and do good to him because he is made in God's image. Even though he has fallen and may be highly defective in many ways, we treat him lawfully for the sake of God's image. We don't do what we feel. A lot of people are total jerks. And if you're an atheist and the guy's cutting you off and flipping you the bird and mocking you, you want to bust him in the mouth. But you don't do what you feel. You do what God says you ought to do because man is made in the image of God. And you have to honor God <clears throat> by treating man lawfully. We are to love our neighbor and do good to him because he is made in God's image. The men who have been guilty of genocide in history and those who have skillfully de uh, are those who have skillfully dehumanized the people that they wanted to kill. They're defined as subhuman. The dehumanization has occurred on the basis of race, the Holocaust, and there's other Holocausts. The Turks killed the Armenians. That was primarily religious. 
class, the communist holocaust against the upper classes, millions of people were slaughtered. In Cambodia, if you wore a pair of glasses, <clears throat> you were taken out and shot. If you were an intellectual, <clears throat> all the teachers, all the universities were cleaned out. They were all executed. And age. The preborn are murdered through abortion on a massive scale. 56 million, over 56 million and counting, in America alone, have been murdered. Simply because of their age. Before they come out of the womb, they're subhumans. They're no different than a rat or a mouse. If you want to scramble their brains with an instrument or if you want to poison them with chemicals, you want to split their skull open and suck out their brain with a vacuum cleaner and then take a knife and chop their body into pieces and then suck it out and toss it in a dumpster, that's perfectly legal. And that's praised by feminists and leftists and Democrats and liberal Republicans as a good thing for society. That's where our culture is. We are no better in America, our civil government, than Adolf Hitler. I'm serious. Hillary Clinton is no more ethical in God's sight than Adolf Eichmann. I'm serious. And the liberals, the liberal Democrats in the Supreme Court are responsible for more deaths in the United States of helpless, innocent babies than Adolf Hitler than Adolf Hitler. All the casualties of World War II between both Japan and Germany are estimated at around 50 million. We've already murdered 56 million people in this country simply because of their age. What is God gonna to do to our nation? And the people love to have it so. They reelected Obama, who's destroying our currency, who's an ethical deviant. A pervert in God's eyes. American children have been slaughtered and tossed in dumpsters. Well, let's look at other applications and implications of this passage. <clears throat> this command regarding the death penalty for murder has a number of important things to teach us regarding violence and civil rule. First, <clears throat> the fact that murderers are to be put to death a violent act indicates that there are just and unjust forms of violence, of killing. Just or righteous use of violence would be a lawful uh, or legitimate uh, warfare. That is what we call a just war. Your country's invaded, let's say, and you have to defend yourself. That's a just war. That's perfectly lawful to get out a machine gun and shoot people attacking you. And if you don't believe in that, then you're, you're wicked and foolish. A war of self-defense or a war against aggression. Personal self-defense. <coughs> Physical force and even the use of deadly force is used to stop rapists, burglars, robbers, and kidnappers. If somebody breaks into your house, you do not know what their intent is. They could be a killer, a rapist, you don't know. And you have a right to shoot them. Now, if they put up their hands and surrender, you turn them over to the police. But if they don't, you put a bullet in their head and you put two in the chest, make sure they're dead, and then call the police. If you're not armed, if you do not have weapons in your home, you're not doing your duty for your family. This idea, well, I'm, I heard a, a liberal on a talk show. Well, I'm, I just pray for my family's protection. No, you pray for your daily bread and you go out and you, you earn your money and you get bread. You pray for your family's defense and you make sure you're able to defend your family. If you live in a bad neighborhood, have a burglar alarm, have TV cameras set up, have a nice gun ready to go. Yes, keep it away from the children, obviously. We're not morons. <clears throat> and the application of capital punishment by the state to lawfully convicted criminals who have committed crimes deemed 
worthy of death by scripture, by God. God defines what the death penalty applies to, not man. The slogan used by modernists and neo-evangelicals that Christians must be consistently pro-life by not only opposing abortion, but also the death penalty is wickedness. It's unscriptural. <coughs> Fortunately, that slogan died out. It was real popular in the late 80s. <clears throat> Second, this law is the first indication in scripture that God has placed the sword of justice, vengeance against evil, and the implementation of uh, an implement of civil protection into the hands of the civil magistrate. Here's the first evidence of that. Men are given coercive power over other men's lives under certain circumstances that are revealed by God. And this is taught right in the New Testament, Romans chapter 13. And Paul, before the Sanhedrin, if I've done anything worthy of death, go ahead, put me to death. What does he mean by that? He means if I've done anything according to the word of God that says I should die for what I've done, prove it. Let's have a trial and put me to death. Civil governments are not just as, uh, are just as obligated to implement the penalties attached to the moral laws as they are to adhere to the moral law itself. This idea, which is common among Reformed churches and evangelicals today, that the judicial law of Moses, the moral laws, well, yeah, maybe some of those moral things apply, homosexuality, bestiality, but the penalties, that's been done away. That's for Israel only. No, God says they're just. So if you think, so you have to say, <clears throat> God says they're just. God wrote the penalties. A, can man do a better job than God? No. B, if man comes up with a penalty different than what God says is just, can that be just? And logically, the answer is no. We have to do what God says we are to do. We have to adhere to the penalties and the moral laws attached to the penalties. <clears throat> Civil rule is grounded not on a human contract or covenant, or a vague natural law, but direct revelation from God. When the Decalogue summarizes principles of personal morality, laws relating to punishments of violence, uh, while the Decalogue does that, laws relating to punishments of violence speak to man in an official capacity. These are direct commands to you judges, to you rulers of society. God's ordering you to do this. And if you don't do it, you're going to be held accountable on the day of judgment for not doing it. This teaching is the essence of the rule of law. God, not the state, defines what is a crime. And God, not the state, determines what is the just or appropriate penalty. Professing Christians who believe that the penalties in Scripture are optional who give human rulers autonomy to decide for themselves what punishments are just or unjust, have unwittingly adopted a form of statism, injustice, and tyranny. When civil magistrates ignore the God-ordained penalties and seek to implement their own, they are implicitly saying that they are wiser and more just than God himself. They are. That's blasphemous. Such men overthrow the pillars of justice and protection that God has erected for the welfare of mankind. Now we're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to deal with the rest of this on teaching on the, uh, the death penalty for murder, capital punishment. And then we're going to wrap up our teaching on Noah by looking at the rainbow and the restatement of the covenant just very briefly. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this wonderful teaching, for our protection, for the protection of human beings. We thank you for it, Lord, for we're sinners. We cannot trust ourselves. We must trust you and your word. We cannot trust in human wisdom. We cannot trust in leaders. We cannot trust in educated men to do the right thing unless they submit to you. So bring revival, Lord. Bring reformation to the churches that they would believe in your holy law and your penalties as well and stop hating your law and acting like fools. In Jesus' name, amen.